video, you're probably wondering if your current pet dog or a prospect that you're considering would be a good fit for service dog work. Today, I'm gonna to go over the criteria you need to consider when deciding if your dog would be a good fit for becoming a service dog. I'm gonna provide a way for you to self-evaluate your dog to see if you should consider the owner training path with your current dog, or if it would be better to find a different prospect to go on this service dog journey with. This video is a perfect jumping off point to get you started on your service dog journey or assess a potential prospect. And at the end, I'm gonna provide some additional training resources for you to check out with your dog. So be sure to stick around for that. Hi, I'm Laura from Doggy U, and I'm a certified guide dog mobility instructor, trick trainer, and service dog trainer who's been evaluating training and placing service dogs for 14 years. And today I'm gonna to help you self-evaluate your service dog prospect. So let's start with the legal definition under the ADA of a service dog. Under the Americans with Disabilities Act, a service dog is defined as a dog that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for a person with a disability. So generally, what that means is that the dog must perform one task that mitigates a portion of your disability. So in real world terms, that means that the dog must have solid obedience training as well as be trained in public access, which means well behaved in public. So that's our general guidelines that we need to follow. So let's talk about what makes a good service dog and considerations we must take into account when deciding if our dog is a good fit. Remember, the dog comes first and we want our dogs to want to do this job for us. And it's unfair to put dogs who are uncomfortable doing public access out into public access work. And here's a little known secret about why dogs fail at service dog work. Dogs don't have to be career changed out of service dog work because they can't do the tasks. They typically get career changed because they can't handle the incredibly difficult demands of public access. The scenarios that service dogs have to deal with are difficult even for the most well-trained and seasoned dogs. The stories I could tell about 14 years of working in the industry are just wild. Everything from people coming up and trying to literally grab the leash out of my hands to adults running over and then dropping to the ground in front of my dog to try and snuggle them in the middle of a mall. And the difficult reality is that most dogs, even with significant training, are not cut out to be service dogs. Look, I'm not meant to be an astronaut. That doesn't make me less of a valuable member of society just because I'm not going to grow up to be an astronaut someday. I'm not an astronaut and that's okay. Dogs that aren't the right fit for service dog work aren't bad dogs. They're just dogs that would prefer to be wonderful pets or even at-home service dogs because task training your service dog for at-home work is always an option. Okay, so let's jump right into it so you can self-evaluate your dog to see if it would be a good candidate for service dog work. First, shout out to the Doggy You community over on Patreon who support this channel and make these videos possible. One of the members asked this question on one of my most recent live Q&As, so I wanted to share the answer with you. If you're interested in joining the community, check out the link down below. So what am I looking for to see if my dog is a good candidate for service dog work? Please note that this self-assessment is not a substitute for an evaluation from an experienced professional service dog trainer, nor is it a temperament test. I highly recommend you get a professional trainer on board, even if it's just for the occasional lesson to help when you get stuck. This will save you time and frustration in the long run. I'll be doing a video soon on how to find an appropriate trainer, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap that little bell button so you get notified when this video comes out. And while you're down there, take a second to reinforce me and help the channel by booping that like button. Jake, Whip, and I would be so grateful. So what we're going to talk about next is mostly about temperament, personality, and genetics, and not about training. While training can shift a dog's behavior, it won't change their underlying genetics and temperament traits. And genetics have a significant amount to do with the traits your dog displays. A good example of genetics at work is my rescued blue healer mix. I got him as a two-year-old with zero training, and when I put him on cows for the first time, he knew quite a bit about working a cow on his own, including exactly how to nip a cow on the heel so that he didn't get kicked in the head when they kicked out at him. This wasn't training. It was purposely bred into him for hundreds of years. That's genetics at work. This is why most service dog programs breed and raise their own dogs so that they have a solid understanding of the dog's genetics, both in terms of health and temperament. And a staggering fact here is that even programs that have been breeding their own dogs specifically for service dog work for decades still have many dogs that come out of the program that don't make it for service dog work. Some success rates can be as low as 30 to 50 percent. Now I'm not saying that to scare you, I just want to point out that genetics matter and if at all possible we want to stack the genetic cards in our favor. And if you're thinking of getting a puppy and want to learn more about choosing a breeder, check out the link in the description below to learn more about it. So let's start with the most important consideration to start with, and that's health. 
The dog must be healthy. They need to be free from pain, chronic health issues, and need to be structurally sound. We don't ask sick dogs or dogs experiencing pain to do work for us. With the advent of genetics, we're now able to screen for many health concerns, and I highly recommend you do that through DNA testing. I'll link options down below. I also recommend you get appropriate physical health screening for your breed. This is especially important if your dog is from an unknown parentage or if you don't have the physical documentation of health screening on the parents. This typically means taking x-rays such as hip and elbow and having them evaluated through Orthopedic Foundation for Animals or OFA or Pen Hip to make sure that the dog isn't likely to have orthopedic problems down the road. OFA's website has a list of recommended screenings by breed which I'll link down below for you to check out. Making sure your prospect is healthy will save you a lot of heartache in the long run, so don't skip this important step. Age. Service dogs generally tend to retire anywhere between 8 years old and maybe 12 years old on the higher end. But generally, they're going to retire somewhere around 9 to 10 years old because of slowing down or health-related issues. It typically takes 1 to 2 years to train an adult dog for service dog work and 2 to 3 years to fully train a prospect up from a puppy, sometimes longer for slow maturing breeds or mobility-related tasks. This means that I don't typically start training a dog for service work past the age of three. Why? Because they may not be fully trained until five, which means they could easily have less than five years of working life. Because training is expensive, both in terms of money, but also time and emotional expenditure, unless the dog is already very well trained, starting a dog in service dog work much later than three or four doesn't make a lot of sense for most owner trainers. But you absolutely can start a dog at any time, so it's up to you to weigh those pros and cons and do what makes sense for you. Next, we need to consider size and propensity for the work. What tasks are you actually looking to train your dog to perform? Can they physically do those tasks? If you're gonna need guide work or mobility support like bracing or counterbalancing, but your dog is only 30 pounds, they won't be able to do any weight-bearing activities. So your task would be limited to non-weight-bearing behaviors like retrieving items. Or if you travel by plane frequently, but you have a great Dane and you don't need that dog for mobility support, then that's probably not a good fit for your lifestyle when a smaller dog may be more comfortable for frequent travel. So make sure that your dog can both physically do the task and will be comfortable in the work you're asking them to do. Now let's talk about temperament and personality traits that your service dog needs to be successful in public access. Look, I'm not saying that every dog needs to start out perfect. There will certainly be things that I talk about here that you'll need to work on a bit before your dog is ready to be successful. But we need to start with a generally solid temperament to get where you want to go. Service dogs should not be dogs that require constant management to make them workable out in public and should never be dogs that have the tendency to react aggressively to people or dogs in their personal space. So in general, expect to have to do lots of training to owner train your service dog, but we want to start with good raw material to work from. First, comfortable with novelty. The dog should enjoy or be neutral to changes in the environment or new places. This means they're comfortable with traffic, shopping carts, new stores, underfootings like grates, open staircases, different textures, lights, public transit, etc. A dog that barely notices a change in environment is a good fit for service dog work. Dogs that need to go to locations a few times to feel safe and comfortable are not good fits for service dog work in most cases. Sociable or human neutral. The dog is comfortable with all types of people even when they enter their personal space. This is important because service dogs are often put into uncomfortable situations where they're in close proximity to others, like on public transit or at a restaurant. People are also going to stare at your service dog, lean over it, taunt it, and do all manner of weird things that your dog has to be comfortable around. Even certain clothing items like large coats, hats, costumes can be scary or concerning to certain dogs. These dogs would not be a good fit for service dog work. You also need to consider emergency situations. If you need to be helped by medical professionals like EMTs, you simply can't have a dog that will guard you from them if you're feeling sick or if you're unconscious. Dog friendly or dog neutral. Your dog doesn't need to be every dog's best friend, but they do need to tolerate dogs in close proximity. You're going to encounter many service dogs and pet dogs out in the world, both well behaved and absolutely poorly behaved. Some dogs will run up into your dog's face and your dog needs to be able to ignore these things, recover quickly, and take them in stride. While training goes a long way in ignoring these types of distractions, dogs that are reactive or uncomfortable with other dogs are not a good fit. A good example of this is I once was on a flight in Bulkhead where there were four dogs total in Bulkhead. That means that out of six seats, four of those people, including myself, had dogs at their feet, both aisle and window on both sides. For a dog that isn't good with dogs in close proximity, this would be a stressful nightmare of a trip, both for that dog and the dogs that have to sit near them. 
confident and easygoing. We want that confident, go with the flow, easy dog. We already have our own disability to account for. We want a dog that's easy to handle and happy to be doing the work. And if you don't have a prospect yet, I highly recommend checking out a well-bred Labrador with service dogs in their lines. There's a reason they're the number one breed used by programs for service dog work. They tend to fit the required personality traits for the job not aggressive or reactive. This one speaks for itself. Service dogs cannot be aggressive or reactive towards other dogs. This is also generally an indicator of a dog that could be experiencing fear, which is not a dog we want responsible for our health and safety. Under the ADA, if your dog is barking or aggressive in a store and you can't get it easily under control, the store employees can legally require you to remove the dog from the store. No, I'm not talking about vocalizing at home. I've worked with plenty of service dogs, especially herding dogs, that will bark at strangers who ring the doorbell or come up the driveway. But if reactivity carries over into their working life, that would make them unsuitable for public access. Not noise sensitive. The dog needs to be good with loud or unexpected noises like fireworks, trucks, alarms or sirens, and construction equipment. Noise sensitivity seems to have a strong genetic link, and dogs that are noise sensitive are not good candidates for service dog work. A dog that startles because a truck backfires behind them and looks towards it is normal. Bolting or flattening to the ground and being unable to move is not. But even for a normal head turn reaction, it's all about recovery from there. If your dog doesn't go back to baseline very quickly and instead is affected by that experience for the next three blocks or so, that's not a good fit for service work because during that time it would be very hard for your dog to execute a task for you to mitigate your disability. And if you want to see some of the testing that I use for noise sensitivity, check out the link below to the DoggyU community at patreon.com slash doggyu, where I show you an example of a puppy test I use to test suitability for service work, including what I'm looking for in a noise sensitivity test. You can join the community for as little as $3 a month and get access to my private training video library of over 125 videos, including my unedited training sessions, so you can see what I do when things don't go as planned. Accepting of touch. As much as you tell others to not pet your dog, the reality of working a service dog in public is that your dog will be touched, tail will be pulled by children, it'll accidentally be stepped on in tight quarters, and your dog needs to have minimal reaction to those episodes and cannot be prone to growling or biting. This would pose a public safety risk. Comfortable in transit. This is a big one. Dogs that get car sick or anxious in the car are not good fits for service dog work. It's unfair to ask a dog to do a job on a daily basis when getting to that job is stressful for them. Those feelings can easily bleed over into your work together. Low prey drive. Intense chasing instinct can interrupt service work. Think squirrels, leaves, sports games. Your dog chasing squirrels in your yard isn't concerning in general, but your dog needs to be able to easily disengage from those distractions out in public. Food drive. It's also helpful if your dog has significant food drive and is more interested in treats or even kibble than most other things. While other reinforcers can work for training dogs like toys and praise, it's easier to teach complex tasks when the dog finds food valuable. Rewarding with a toy can work at home in some cases, but rewarding with a tug in public isn't practical. So Labrador level food drive is incredibly helpful considering the amount of training that is involved in raising and shaping a service dog. Moderate energy. While this is not a requirement, a dog that requires significant exercise just to be able to be calm in public isn't a good fit for most people, and the dog most likely won't be happy doing the job. You don't want to have to run your dog for an hour just to be able to have them settle in Starbucks for 30 minutes while you have a coffee, unless significant exercise is already a part of your lifestyle. Moderate and sometimes low energy dogs are a good fit for most people, especially those with chronic illnesses that can leave you housebound. We want the dog to have enough energy and motivation to do the job without a ton of excess. So be sure to consider energy requirements and the appropriate mental and physical exercise you will need to give your dog to be successful on a daily basis. And finally, has an off switch. While this can be cultivated, it's easier if your dog has a natural off switch and settles in any environment. Your service dog needs to tolerate long periods of doing nothing, especially if you have a traditional office job or are going to school. Most of service dog work is walk somewhere, maybe do a task, maybe for a couple minutes, and then lay under a chair for an hour. Dogs that are happy to do this are good fits for service dog work. Okay, so now that you've learned all about what makes a good service dog, tell me down in the comments below, is your dog a good fit for service dog work? If so, what tasks are you interested in training? I'm always looking to make videos on subjects that you're interested in, so feel free to drop your ideas down below. And if you're ready to delve further into your training journey, I've linked a bunch of resources for you down in the description below.
But your next step should be to click on this video here where I talk about service dog etiquette and what you need to know to have a well-behaved service dog out in public. It's the kind of knowledge that will make people say, wow, what a well-behaved dog, or I didn't even know there was a service dog in here. And that's one of the highest compliments you can receive. So be sure to click on it now. You all have an awesome day and happy training.